Please remain standing if you're able for today's gospel reading. I'll be reading from the Gospel of Luke, uh, starting at chapter 10, verse 1. I assure you that what or whoever doesn't enter into the sheep pen through the gate, but climbs over the wall is a thief and an outlaw. The one who enters through the gate is the shepherd of the sheep. The guard at the gate opens the gate for him, and the sheep listen to his voice. He calls his sheep by name and leads them out. Whenever he has gathered all of his sheep, he goes before them and they follow him because they know his voice. They won't follow a stranger, but will run away because they don't know the stranger's voice. Those who heard Jesus use this analogy didn't understand what he was saying. And this next section is, I am the gate. So Jesus spoke again. I assure you that I am the gate of the sheep. All who came before me were thieves and outlaws, but the sheep didn't listen to them. I am the gate. Whoever enters through me will be saved. They will come in and go out and find pasture. The thief enters only to steal, kill, and destroy. I came so that they could have life indeed, so that they could live life to the fullest. This is the word of God for the people of God. Thanks be to God. Amen. Please be seated. I invite you to pray with me. Dear Lord, let the words of my mouth and the meditations of all of our hearts be acceptable in your sight this day and always. We pray in faith in the name of Jesus our Christ. Amen. So we've been talking about John now for quite a while, and we know that John is a book of signs, and we know that John is a book of Jesus claiming to be the Messiah that was prophesied all throughout the Old Testament. And over and over and over again, he uses those terms. But today we have another term. And Shirley asked me at Bible study how many times, you know, Jesus says I am. And I did look up my paper that I'm going to hand in next week. And uh, I found 23 times. I hope I got them all. But uh, it's 23 times in, in the book of John that I found where Jesus says, I am the light, I am the life, I am the bread, you know, I am the gate today, I am, I am all of these different things. And I am goes all the way back to Moses on Mount Sinai. And, you know, if you're new to the sermon series, when Moses asked God who it is that's talking to him, God simply responded, I am. And that's what Jesus is claiming in the book of John. I am, I am, I am, all of these things. So now he says that I am the gate. And just keep that in mind as we go, go through this because he's collecting all of these metaphors. And today we're hearing about the sheep again. So we dragged out our, uh, our sheep cutouts there from uh, the Lafayette School. I think they came from, right, Diane? The art department there, yeah. So they're, they're kind of cool. I like them, you know. I don't know if they're ready to bite each other or they're, they're getting along, but uh, they're, they're the sheep nonetheless. So where, where does the shepherd, you know, whole theme come from? Anybody got a guess on that one? It goes back to an Old Testament team that was anointed by Samuel. David. Okay, I was going to give you the slingshot as the next, uh, the next thing. David was a shepherd. And the reason he was so good at the slingshot is because sheep won't follow they have to be led from behind, and that's why sheepdogs always instinctually circle behind, you know, the sheep. If you've ever watched uh, a sheepdog trial, it's, it's pretty fascinating. But sheep have to be led from behind, or the shepherd would shoot the uh, sheep in the backside lightly with a, a rock, and that would get the herd moving, and then, you know, they all start to, to go in the direction that they want. Now, sheep are also really stupid. And I know God calls us sheep, so I don't want to offend anybody here, but I'm, I'm right there with you. You know, sheep are, are, are not intelligent. They will just graze and graze and graze and graze. Um, you know, in this part of the country, we don't have cliffs where they'll go, but they'll graze themselves up a mountainside and end up on a cliff that they can't get down off of. And they wander from the herd because they're grazing, grazing, grazing. They're very nearsighted. They can't see far beyond, right? We're pretty nearsighted too, right? We're, we're so worried about us today that we don't really worry about our, our journey too far ahead. You know, so there's a lot of similarities between us and sheep. But again, I'm not you know, saying that to insult anybody because I'm a sheep too and I'm just as in need of Christ and that leading as anybody. But the good shepherd comes from 
the Davidic king, and, and the Messiah was promised to come from the house of David. So that's important to, to keep in mind. And if you read on, you know, Jesus is going to talk further about being the good shepherd and, uh, you know, him laying down his life for the one sheep. So I encourage you to read on the rest of chapter 10 when you leave here today. But the gathering of the lambs in his arms, that's also prophesied in Isaiah back in chapter 40. And now in today's text, it's important to remember, remember when we were talking about the blind man that was healed, he was blind from birth, and Jesus healed him with the spit and the mud. We talked about that about five or six weeks ago when it came up in the lectionary. He's talking to the Pharisees right before this passage who were still arguing with him about claiming the name of God. Because when he says, I am, that was loud and clear to them that he was claiming to be, to be God. Highly upsetting to them. So this is the context in which today's scripture comes in. So keep all of that in mind. And remember who the Gospel of John was written to. Barbara knew the answer a few weeks ago. It was written about 70 years after Jesus' uh, uh, death. And it was when the temple was torn down and the center of Jewish life, the center of Jewish worship had been completely unrattled and upset. And now here you are with the Jews and the Christians in the synagogues and they're starting to argue. And they're starting to fight for power because their whole system of worship that had been in place for thousands of years is now gone. And, you know, those sheep that, that look so friendly, now they're starting to bite one another, all right? Now, who remembers what made the, uh, the deadly spirit that crossed over Egypt, right? Who, who remembers what they had to do, the Jews? Yes, they had to slaughter a sheep, sprinkle the blood across their doorpost, right? That was a, a marking of, of blood, a sacrifice of blood, right? So you have in the same temple, okay, envision us in the same church. You have this side of the room saying, we are saved by the blood. We follow the old ways. We follow the Paschal lamb. We follow the blood sacrifice in that way of living, right? Now you have this side of the church going, oh, no, wait. We were baptized by Jesus Christ. We were baptized in the name of the Holy Spirit. We we are saved by Christ and, and, and water and the Spirit, right? So what does this side say to you guys? You know, you guys are wrong. You're getting it wrong. You're not saved by water. You're saved by the blood. And what are you guys saying to this side? You guys got it wrong. You got to follow Christ, right? And what happens? A gate goes up, right? A fence, a divide, a wall. You know, it may start out with quiet attitudes. It may start out with, ah, I'm not talking to Carl anymore. He doesn't know what he's talking about, you know. And Carl, Carl's sitting over there going, oh, that Charlie, man, he's crazy. He's, he's just got it so wrong. I wish he'd open his Bible and read it. What's the matter with these people, you know? So we got this gate, right? What did we read in today's passage? Who's the gate? Jesus, Jesus is the gate. Are we the gate? In the times of the writing of this, sheep were somebody's debit card, okay? What do you do with your debit card and your credit card and your checkbook and your wallet? Where do you keep them, folks? It's one of the most sacred things you guard, right? Somebody gets your debit card, your credit card, and your wallet, you're in big trouble. Right? You're in big trouble. Your identity's gone. You're, you're going to face a nightmare. Your wealth gets taken. You have a debit card. You don't get that money back. Right? So you guard that, right? Well, in the times of this, the sheep were the wealth. If you had lots and lots of sheep, you were wealthy. If you didn't have sheep, you were poor. So what do you think they did with their sheep at night? They did the same thing that we do with our wallets. Okay? They brought them, they had enclosures right next to their house. And they would be stone walls because they didn't have metal fencing. But they would be stone walls and they'd be covered with uh, thorns and thickets and things so that the sheep wouldn't hop over the wall. And they would even hire 
a person, usually several families at once, would hire a person to be the gatekeeper, to watch their wealth. Because the sheep were the, you know, it was a source of, of uh, clothing, it was a source of food, it was a source of milk, and it was a source of barter to get things that, that you couldn't get you know, on your own if you were a tender of sheep. So they guarded their wealth, and they would put them in a pen. So if we, if we are the, uh, the gatekeepers, let me ask you this. And anybody knows the answer to this, I'm going to give you a mint. All right, you ready? The closest person gets the mint. How many denominations do we have in the United States? Ten? A hundred? You guys are off by thousands. In fact, you're off by tens of thousands. How many denominations? Anybody? Take a lofty guess. Two million five hundred eighty-seven thousand three hundred sixty. Maybe worldwide. You yeah. Said a guess. All right. Maybe worldwide. <laughs> Lower than that. <laughs> Anybody want the mint? You said ten. <laughs> or no? You said a hundred. You said a hundred. All right. You get the mint. In the United States, there are forty-two thousand denominations. Oh, you said 53? Oh, you, all right, then I'll give you a mint later. Sorry. <laughs> That's it. Give her the mint. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, you don't get the mint, Lori. I take the mint back. But there are 42,000 denominations in the United States alone. And you go worldwide, we're probably up to 2 million. I don't know the answer to that. And just why we're doing stats, the, uh, the Catholic Church in the United States claims 1.2 million. Um, in the Protestant denominations, we are second to one. Anybody know who the first might be? The Southern Baptist Convention. All right? We claim 87 million members nationwide, and I, I forget the stat of the Baptist, but they, they're over 100,000, or 100 million. Many of these 42,000, oh, Daniel's looking it up, smart Alec. <laughs> Okay, 55. See, we're getting worse. We're getting more and more separate, right? See, what happens is we claim to be the gatekeeper. Because the minute I think that I get it all right, and many of these denominations do, we as Methodists do not. We do not claim to have it all right. In fact, we strive constantly as a denomination to unite and find common things that do unite us with other denominations constantly. And that's one of the things I'm proud about, to be a Methodist. We're always working towards that. But yet, so many of the denominations claim that this is the way. You know, you have to believe just like me. You have to do the things just like me. You know, listening to to Maureen's daughter talk on uh, Wednesday at the UMW meeting, she talks very differently than us, right? But we're on the same side. We're on the same side. And I think that's what's important to remember. You know, anybody ever lived in a gated community or been to a gated community? What does the gated community do? It separates people, right? It keeps people out and keeps you in. And then the people inside the gate, they usually make up extra rules and extra laws. And, you know, my parents have their house in Pennsylvania. We call it the land of no, because basically if you're outside the house, you know, you get a ticket for something, you know. My, my dad, over the years, you know, would get tickets mailed to him. You know, anytime we were up there with friends and stuff, and he'd be like, I didn't even know we were doing anything wrong, and you'd get a $50 ticket, you know. I drove through the gate one day. It didn't help, so. <laughs> <laughs> that was $300. So I got lost. Oh, I'm talking about gated communities and, and how they keep stuff out. But... I want, to, I want to start bringing this down to us. I think I've made the point that we are not the gatekeeper. I think I've made the point that Jesus Christ knows each and every one of us by name and is calling us. And it's not up to us to think that we get it all right and put up that gate, all right? I want to read you something I saw on my desk last night. I saved it a couple months ago, but I came across it last night. This is take off your bib and put on your apron. A preacher was shaking his hands at people, 
I'm sorry, as a preacher was shaking hands as people went out of the church one Sunday, and she reached out to shake the hand of a man who clearly was visiting. As she welcomed him, the guy began to explain that they were church shopping. They were actually members of a nearby congregation, but were dissatisfied, so they were checking out her church. That is always an awkward conversation, because there are too many people with no church to be stealing other members from another's church. We, we sense the same thing, right? The man's response was instant. The trouble with our old church is that we simply aren't being fed. The pastor responded just as quickly, oh, she said, then perhaps that is because you need to take off your bib and put on your apron. I like this girl, right? In case you have forgotten, that is exactly what it means to be a member of your church. You are hosts, not guests. Producers, not consumers. You are here to serve, not to be served. Because in case you have forgotten, you are the body of Christ. There is work to be done that only you can do. You don't have the luxury of saying, I wish the church would, because you are the church. Jesus went to the mountain and met with Moses and Elijah. He was reminded of his own calling to be the giver of a new law and the prophetic voice of a new realm. When Jesus and Peter, James and John returned to the valley, they were immediately confronted by the father whose son needed healing. He complained that he brought the boy to his disciples, but they could do nothing. I always wondered if it was that they couldn't or they wouldn't. Oh, I don't think any disciple of Jesus would refuse to help if they could. But when we get so caught up in being fed, we forget that our job is to be the ones feeding. We are God's people, so we are life's hosts, not life's guests. We are producers of grace and mercy and hope, not the consumers. Oh yes, we need to be nourished ourselves. Even Jesus went up to the mountain, but he didn't build a tent to stay there. He gathered his close friends at the mountain and then scattered them into the world to serve. This is the rhythm of the church, and if we neglect either side of the body of Christ, we're going to be weakened. I like that girl. <laughs> Folks, is our gate open? You know, is our table truly open to the community in Buttsville? We had a family stop by yesterday, and I am delighted to tell you I never got a chance to talk to them outside of the initial greeting when I was on the grill because all of you were talking to them. Yes, yes, it makes me proud. I mean, they didn't have a minute where somebody wasn't talking to them. And I turned my back and they were gone. They came because they saw, they, they had just seen the documentary about uh, world hunger and they saw our advertising, I'm not sure what they saw, but they saw our stuff and they wanted to come with their kids and participate in a body of Christ that was doing something about it instead of talking about it. And all of you guys spent time with them, or many of you did. That's an open gate. That's an open gate. You know, let's stop being so fussy about, you know, my way is right, the blood of Christ and that sacrifice of the Paschal Lamb, and my way is about the baptism, and I am saved by the water and the Spirit. Let's stop worrying about all of that. Let's stop worrying about the Catholics and the Baptists and the free, free uh, evangelists and the Presbyterians and, you know, those...